Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On today's episode, drummer, producer, and songwriter, Tommy Harden. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, everyone? Rich Redman here. Another exciting episode of The Rich Redman Show coming to you from Music City, USA. Now, if you've been listening, family, fans, friends, you know about my sidekick, my man about town, my longtime buddy, co-producer, co-host, Jim McCarthy. And comfortable shoe wearer. Yes. Yeah. Are those Skechers? They, I believe they are. You know, who's our next guest is David Cook, and I think he was an ambassador for, for Skechers. He's coming this afternoon, so you guys will have to talk about that. He's a lucky man. <laughs> They're very comfortable shoes. <laughs> so we know that we're on this podcast, Jim, we're talking to authors, we're talking to comedians, we're talking to creatives, musicians, lots of drummers. Why? Because drummers, we're thick as thieves, man. We know each other, we love each other, we lift each other up. And this next gentleman moved here in 1991, and he has not stopped. He is a workhorse drummer, live and in the studio. My friend, Tommy Harden. How are yeah. you, bud? Good. How do Good you, to how see you, 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 man. We got some We got some applause here somewhere. <laughs> it's, uh, it's on the wrong bank. There we go. Oh, my oh. God. Yeah. Cool. Nice. The, the, ups, the upward slide whistle it's could like be a, appropriate. It's like a video slash drum well, we were talk, <laughs> We were talking about cartoons because you were saying that your, your bride has a great voice because she's a singer and you guys have a band together but also she might start getting into voiceover and that and, and like cartoon work you're always going to hear that sound yeah yeah she's got Ooh. an incredible voice that's awesome it, like a chocolatey low alto kind of voice you're rocking the cardigan man i love the cardigan dude it's it's made a major comeback you know the funny thing is i don't like warm i don't i'm not a summer kind of guy i like winter and i like wearing the cardigan i love layers all the time yeah you know what i don't like i'm not a shorts guy mm -mm. i mean i've been told by by some girls ex-wives ex-girlfriends that i have nice legs mm. um they're hairy but uh they're nice they have a nice shape for a man because i run a lot you know i don't do a lot of boot camps but i'm not a uh, i'm not a shorts guy well I do have one question. Sorry for my, my ADD is kicking in. I love it. How That's do what you we do get here. to become a Skechers ambassador? They they probably go, oh wow, you won American Idol. Could, We're going to give you shoes because you know I have six kids. If yes. anybody needs to be a Skechers ambassador, I mean that could be an entire episode right there. Um, how does that work? Is it just like every time you make love, you have a kid? How does this work? We finally bought a TV. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, what so, you want to do tonight? Are you springing for like um, uh, Comcast cable, or are you just have you made the transition like the millennials to just watching Netflix and Hulu? We only have uh, we we have Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. I think we have stars and we also have acorn because we're in we're into the brit shows i don't i haven't that's okay i don't feel so bad about myself because i canceled canceled my cable and i feel like i'm saving money there and so netflix is getting the ten dollars hulu is getting the ten dollars hbo now is getting the fifteen dollars so you're still looking at about fifty dollars but it's not as bad as 280 300. no no, no it, it got to the point where we would just never watch it and, and we were paying these big bills a, a month and we finally went, this is stupid. Yeah. You know what that comes from? Um, guys in our, I think, age category, we like to sit in our lazy boys with a remote and click channels. Mm -hmm. There's something very um, warm and fuzzy about that. Yeah. And then I finally just... <laughs> I just, I, yeah, I, I, uh, I circumcised myself from that, from that habit. Well, the TV that we have now is, it's so complicated. Mm -hmm. I feel like I need to go take a course at MIT and TV. Smart TV. Oh my God. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, now, just to level the playing field a little bit, I was just going to tell uh, the listeners, whether you are a drummer, musician, or not, you're going to be impressed by the list of uh, the folks that you've played with over the years. Did you 14 years with Reba McIntyre? 14 years. And you are currently with the iconic country rock band, Alabama. Yep. That's been uh, three two, three years or so? Three? About, about two and a half. Two it's... and a half years is nice. And then you also played with Ricky Skaggs. Yeah, I was with Ricky Skaggs for three years. Uh, we called it the Ricky Skaggs College of Knowledge. Oh, so so you went to, so is that way if you're saying you didn't go to college or you? No, you? no, no. But it, but being in Ricky's band is like a learning experience. It's like the history of country music right it's, there. Well, you just learn so much. And that, and the, um, I could tell you so many Ricky stories. Uh, and, the just, and just, you'll have to stop me because I'll be like ADD pinball man. Love it. <laughs> you're a pinball wizard. Yeah. So what did you learn? Oh my gosh. Uh, I tell you, one of the things that I learned is 
uh, how to develop harmonies, how to how to write harmonies. Wow! Because um, you know, a lot of people will take and do like three part harmonies, and they'll just kind of do this block thing. Mm-hmm. Ricky will have he'll have the top voice dive bomb and go down to the bottom voice, and they'll all they all be it's like a Celtic knot. Yeah, and and well, that's when nice. you, when you really listen to it, you're like, and it's very subtle, but. But it's it just takes it up to the next level, and so we really learned. I learned a lot about uh, voice arranging, which which you know we we uh, we learned about horn arranging in college, but not a lot with voices usually. At least when I went to school, yeah. Like, There's something I bet you didn't know about me. Yeah, I used to be an orchestral arranger. No, I didn't know that. Is that what, yeah. what you went to school for? Yeah, I studied music composition and arranging, and I was literally a paid arranger for a local orchestra. They'd call and say, "I need a." Uh, full orchestra arrangement of the, uh, Beatles medley, uh, SATB vocals, and a full rhythm section. And nice. I was like, Psh. and I was the old school guy. I had the it's long staff paper pad of pad of uh, like thirty, the Judy Green paper, mm-hmm. and I would I would write it. And then when I first moved to town, the thing that kept me eating, uh, literally, I, Eric Darkin was the only person that I knew in town. Period. Eric Darkin I, is a, a one of the most recorded percussionists in Nashville for the last thirty years. He's probably years. one of the most recorded percussionists on the planet. Right. I mean, he has played on, and he's very under the radar. He, you know, doesn't incredibly doesn't make, under the radar. Doesn't make a splash about it. But you look on every rec- record that you pick up, and his name is on it. It's 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 amazing. He's got a nice collection. He's like the Emil Richards of Nashville. He he really is. God and rest he, his so soul. when I I literally moved we we moved here not knowing one person and that was Eric. We lived in a crappy hotel for about 10 days. He got me a music copying job. So I copied music for about the first 2 years of here by hand. Yeah. Yeah, like like with the, the you had the this triangle, you know, this plastic triangle and one of those pins with the nibs on it. Yeah. And you would literally just kind of go and and they'd hand you a full orchestra score at 10 p.m. And they'd say, see you at 10 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, 12 hours to do this. Yeah. And now what did that pay? What does something like that pay? Oh, it's, I mean, you, it was still really good money. I mean, this is like 1991 dollars. Um, you know, a full orchestra would be like 400 bucks. That's great. 450 bucks. And so did you move here uh, with your bride, Lori? Did you, were Absolutely. you married? Yeah, we, you we had been married for two years. So where are you coming from? Well, we we uh, she's originally from Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and that's where nice. we lived before we moved here for one winter. Um, and we decided to take a winter off, and she just got you know a job like at a hotel or something, and I stayed home and practiced. And uh, Lori's we lived with her folks, and so I set up my drum kit upstairs. Uh, her mom vacuumed a lot. <laughs> Because she could Some people do that, yeah. Well, because I'm pretty like, OCD you know, with that. Uh, no, she vacuumed to drown out the sound of the drums. Oh, <laughs> so, wow! Because I because I wanted to, I wanted to move to Nashville, and I you know I, I was like you know big into like Weckl on Kali Uden. So yeah, I was just talking about those cherry red recording customs I picked up over there that were signed, not signed, but they were used by Weckl. Oh, I I was a Weckl nut. I had the mullet. I had the VO5 hot oil treatment mullet. Yeah, I I you know. Crazy. The whole '80s thing. I mean, I remember seeing, I saw uh, the Electric Band, uh, and I remember I literally had my. F- I was sitting on the front row. I had my foot on the monitor on Frank Gambale's monitor. Nice. Oh, you were that close. Yeah, it was that close. Well, he yeah. kind of he took the ball from from a uh, from from Gad and and with the density of notes and his phrasing, he etched it up a notch. And so I think he was like a really good guy to listen to at that time. It was a game changer. I know he really expanded my vocabulary. Oh my God. He expanded everybody's vocabulary. Probably drove a lot of people out of the music business because when like, you hear what is this him, you're guy like, doing? you're like, I'm really depressed. There's yeah. no way I can learn all this stuff. But, but when you slow it down at all, it's all just stickings and combinations, but it's just slowing it down. Yeah. yeah you know? Yeah. And here's another thing I bet you didn't know. I used to drive down to uh, uh, North Texas State and take lessons from Ed Sof. All right. Another Sophian. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. We just he, did a little fun little panel on the drum channel with with uh, Sutter and Carlock and Blair Senta. And, he would tie me in knots for an hour and a half and then send me home. And I'm, yeah. Go practice this, kid. Yeah. I'd be like, I can't move. I'm tied in a knot. Go practice, kid. So, <laughs> so Lori's from, did you, were you guys skiers? Huh? Were you skiers, uh, Colorado? Oh God! How could you not be in yeah. Colorado and not be a skier I'm in Steamboat? I would just be so worried about like uh, you know the injuries with being a drummer. Yeah, well, I uh, I kind of did skiing for dummies. Yeah, and because uh, Tully, are, as our bass player, is a monstrous skier. Well, yeah, I I I would just pretty much do the the 
the the bunny slopes and the blues and maybe a black every now and then if it didn't have the, the moguls on it and if it were like an easy black but but usually the blues are about my speed yeah so and then where were you from i'm originally from greensboro north carolina we oh. just we just played there uh, alabama just did a show there sold out the coliseum thirteen thousand five hundred tickets beautiful i mean they're still uh, putting butts in seats man they how are many number ones how many number ones 43 number ones. that's hits. fantastic 43 number one hits. And I, so, they're not all on the show you got to pick and choose Oh, it's the frustrating thing is uh, for me is they're not playing my favorite songs. I, I'm not like I, I least tell me they're doing the closer you get. Oh, yeah, they're absolutely doing the closer you get. Um, uh, they're uh, I want to hear "Take Me Down," "Take Me Down," yeah, and uh, that's my I love that song, which the lead singer from Exile wrote. Yeah, well, you can always say Pennington. you can always say, "Hey guys, you know I sing. Can I come up and do this song?" You know, the funny thing is, uh, <laughs> Teddy knows that I sing. That's great. And to, and during sound check, he lets me sing "Take Me Down." That's beautiful. And uh, there was a couple of shows that Randy had lost his voice and just barely made it through, and we were all on standby to to be able to sing. Wow! And he fortunately he didn't we didn't he didn't need us. Not the whole show. Sing the whole show? No, no, just like sing a song or just to give him a break. You know? Yeah, because that's a lot of that's a lot of responsibility right there. Singing all those number ones for those yeah. ferocious fans. Yeah, but forty three number one hits. And you know the funny thing of is uh, a lot of artists nowadays like to write their own songs. They only wrote 20% of their songs. A lot of outside writers. So they, 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 so they had to tour, sell those t-shirts. Well, the, you know, honestly, the, a lot of the artists back then, if you think of like Reba, George Strait, uh, Alabama, the, most of those guys did... Uh, Outside, so, outside I mean, songs. Even Al, Alan Jackson, yeah. you know, he didn't write Five O'Clock Somewhere. Well, I mean, look at, I mean, Al Dean's had a 20-year career so far, and he always chooses the best outside songs. See, that's the thing. It's, you, you're you shooting yourself in the foot trying to write everything yourself. Right. You it's, should try, but the best song wins. But the best song should win, and and honestly, it's, and i uh, tell you a story about, uh, Teddy told me about uh, the song, uh, I'm in a hurry and don't know why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Huge hit. That was a big one. Uh, so Josh Leo was, I think, producing that record, and they just didn't feel like they had a, a single on the record yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the last, they had they had a double session. They had finished the 10 o'clock. Uh, Teddy had called Roger Murr and said, I need I need some songs bad, please. So Roger, you know, comes in, puts CD down, leaves. And Roger's wife had talked him into putting I'm in a hurry and don't know why on the CD and he hated that song. So he said, Don't listen to that. That's I hate that song. That's not you guys. And so uh Teddy goes to lunch, got his little C D player, yep. and he's listening, and he goes, uh first song, you know, great song, second song, great song, third song, and then I'm in a hurry and don't know why. He said he almost spit a sandwich out. He literally Picked up a CD player, left his food on there, and went back to the. We're doing this, and he said, "I found it. I found the hit." Yeah, and Josh. It was said, Teddy. Uh, yeah, it was Teddy, and and Josh said, um, "We don't have any more room on the record." He said, "What song are we cutting this afternoon?" He goes, "One of yours." And he, he said, "Bump it." That's nice. That's yeah. a big picture right there. Yeah. That's that, good. Team but that, commitment, right but there. that shows you why they're still packing out and selling out arenas, right? So, so you move here in '91. Um, I'm doing the math. 90 to 2000, 2000. 30 years, bro. 30 years coming up. Are you just, so it's coming up. Do you know the exact day you moved to town? <laughs> I, I I know it doesn't look like it because I did move here when I was four. So, <laughs> so. You're rocking the Chris Stapleton look, man. <laughs> did you decide on that or you just got lazy one month? Man, I, I need a haircut so bad. I'm about three months behind needing a haircut. But I know, I mean, this is this thing is like all gangster right now. This is what people are doing. Yeah, I, you know, for some reason, I, I I did a no shave November about ten years ago, and then it just never went away. I had ten years ago. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's. Well, you look very wise. I got to tell you a story about uh, when I first moved to town. Oh, you're probably looking to see what Jim is doing over here. And guys, if you guys are listening and you hear clickety clack, Jim is always busy because he's taking show notes. So when you see our show notes, he's composing them on the spot when we say something prophetic and interesting Among and he's probably things. designing logos and captions and ways to promote the show so jim thank you for your time and talent you're very welcome okay <laughs> don't don't believe what he's saying he's playing tetris so. <laughs> galaga <clears throat> <laughs> i love galaga okay so i moved to town mm -hmm. i knew eric darkin i so he got me some copying jobs um when i was living in steamboat a bar, a buddy of mine loaned me a giant like console 
and I had a four track cassette recorder, a Tascam four track cassette recorder. So, and I was, you know, a composer and I had some keyboard and MIDI stuff. So I created three songs um, that were kind of like drummy, you know, solos and lot, lots of hits and, hits and figures. Yeah. And so I did this, uh, I did, I made this tape and I literally did it live to tape because, you know, you couldn't punch in on a cassette four track. That's right. So, so I made this demo tape and it's very kind of Weckling, Weckl influenced, you know, that kind of thing. So I moved to town, a, a songwriter buddy of mine says, Hey, I'm good friends with Eddie Bears. Let me call him and see if, uh, see if, uh, you can hang out at a session or something I'm like that would be unbelievable fly on the wall because man i mean you talk about i was just looking at at, at your podcast this morning with pedigree eddie. man eddie <sighs> he is like a genius he's working a genius. nine to five i mean he's that was you know everybody says your lifespan as a session career guy is five years but it's been 40 years for him and i mean hundreds of number one hits hun in the hundreds mm -hmm. so so anyway, so he calls Eddie. Eddie goes, sure, man, let him tag along. So he let me tag along for two days. Nice. Um, the first day was at uh, Fireside. Second day was at 16th Avenue Sound, which neither one of the studios are there now. I know. What are they? Uh, clothing stores, boutiques, the, well, high they're, rises? They're, uh, they're putting, I think, condos were 16th Avenue. Uh, and then I think Fireside is now condos as well. I don't so, remember Fireside. No. Fireside had a golf course it had a drum booth that was like a dome, and the top of it had that green grass carpet with a putting green on the top of it. Wow, I never worked there. It was, who's, was it Little Jimmy Dickens? And it was somebody, I can't remember, somebody will tell me whose it was, but yeah. it was, it was not, um, oh, it was, it was, um, uh, I'll, it'll come to me in a minute. Yeah, you know, we're at, yeah. Anyway, we so. We take our ginkgo balboa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was a guy. I can't remember his name. I played on one of his records. Uh, who's the guy that uh, that Gordon Moat always imitates? You're putting me on the spot now. Um, Gordon Moat is a wonderful keyboard player, and I don't know who he imitates. Uh, okay, it'll come to me in about By the end of the episode in about for sure. fifteen minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so I go to this thing after so after two days. He, he he's such a gentleman, and it was so nice, and uh, I gave him this cassette. And I said, please listen to this. And he listened to it. I yes. can't tell you how many CDs I've gotten from other drummers that I've never listened to. And he took he, the time to listen to it. He took the time to listen to it. And a couple of, uh, I, I ended up getting ca calls from people saying, Eddie Bears recommended you for this. And it was usually like a, like a live gig. A live first. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. It, it wasn't a studio thing. Yeah. And so <clears throat> Fast forward. So I'm here for four months. Everybody is telling me, go get a job because it's going to take you two years. Right. It's going to take you two years. And I'm like, so <clears throat> I had heard that Barbara Mandrell was looking for a drummer. Great. I auditioned for her too. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I pulled out my modern drummer with Randy Wright on the cover. Right. And literally, you know, probably for those of you millennials, you want to know what we're talking about. But I pulled the phone book out. Yes. And I found Randy Wright's number and called him and like literally cold called him. So it, it ended up, I guess, getting... He was the drummer leaving. He was the drummer leaving. What is Randy Wright doing now? What did he He do? was got into management, I think. Okay, gotcha. I wonder so if he's still in Nashville doing he, stuff. He left the dark side and he decided he wanted to make some money. He smelled yeah. the money, yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, so, so I called and uh, it must have called forwarded to his management company. Mm -hmm. And so his partner calls... Um, uh, picks up the phone and uh, he says, yeah, so uh, I heard that uh, Barbara Mandrell is looking for a drummer. And, you know, we talked for about 15, 20 minutes. And um, he says, so tell me about yourself. Who, who have you played for? And I went, uh, I just moved to town. I haven't played for anybody, but Eddie Bears has been recommending me. And so little known to me, he had been called uh, one hour before that from Steve Gatlin and said, I need a drummer. My drummer's quitting. There's your first gig, the Gatlin Brothers. That was my that was my first gig. I talked my way onto this gig with no audition and uh, basically met Steve Gatlin. And, and I did it. And this is the power of when you have somebody like Eddie Bears. You could drop that name and it's heavy. But it, the, <laughs> just the <sighs> reputation of Eddie Bears. When Eddie Bears says, I've been recommending somebody, they're like, that's all I need to know. Yes. And so I and met- And now you're that guy. I met Steve Gatlin- Shook his hand. He gives me a cassette, circles all these songs, and goes, learn these. I'll see you in two weeks. Perfect. 
and I ended up I ended up playing with them for about 15 months. It was their f- first farewell tour, and of course, anybody that says they're doing a farewell tour, they never do farewell no, tours. It's like Cher, she did seven of them. Yeah, there's like first, second, third farewell tour. Motley Crue. Yeah. So, and on that tour. I moved to town and in four months. I was making it was like fifty grand that year. Nice. I mean, and, and uh, I, I mean, I was making the kind of money that they're paying guys now. Your first year in town, you needed an accountant, man. I tell you what, and <laughs> <clears throat> we played for so many celebrities, it blew my mind. Nice. We played. We did one show in California. Um, Vince Gill came up on the stage. John Denver and Glenn Campbell. Wow! They all played, and we all played for them. So and they're I, looking back, and they're seeing your face, and they remember. I got, and I had to pinch myself because I'm playing country roads. I'm play, freaking playing country roads with John freaking Denver. Great. Um, we, we I can't remember what we played for. Uh, I think we played Rhinestone Cowboy for Glenn yeah. Campbell. Oh, man. that's a good one. It was one of those situations you're like, can you turn up the vocal in my monitor? Even if yeah. you don't know anything about country music or you're not a fan, Rhinestone Cowboy, you know that one. Yeah. You also don't work at 9 to 5. You, you you know these songs, but that is a very, very powerful thing. And you know what's so sweet is that Eddie's been a guest on the show. Lonnie's been a guest. They both listened to my demo as well. They took the time to listen to it because I had my Weckley demo too. And Eddie was like, yeah, kid, you got this. And you know who else was really sweet? Tommy Wells. God rest his soul. Yeah, he he goes, you're that Weckl, North Texas kid, right? I was like, yeah. And he goes, well, come hang out. You know, let me show you how to play this country music stuff that we do. Yeah. And then years later, it was so funny. He was like, I'm so proud of you, kid, because he would go and he would do sound-alikes of Al Dean songs. And he would have to chart out my my drum parts. Mm. It was like it had gone full circle. I've done that. Yeah, it's crazy. I've done that because everybody in town has done some sort of sound-alike session. K-Tel. And, and I know I've done... K-Tel's. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, the funny thing, too, is... Sorry to... Oh, no. You know, what's really funny is that, yeah, Jim is just... He's making the world go around over that, here. What? You're making the world going around. Thank go, you. Yeah, you're... you're I'm, I'm listening. Just uh, a little bit more ADD pinball. I used to... Uh, when <laughs> I when I would go down and take lessons with Ed, I would always go and sit and watch the one o'clock band sure. rehearse. Yeah. And man, oh, man. I mean, you talk about some serious cat musicians yeah so and you played in the one o'clock right yeah we did a record live in portugal 1994 god that's unbelievable <laughs> the the two guys to go all I, the way to portugal to make a live record the two guys that i remember seeing because i mean they were burned in my brain uh one was uh dan wajahowski absolutely oh my Gosh, currently boy. with uh, ending ending the tour with Frampton, but he was my mentor, five years older than me, hanging out in Dallas, Texas. Played in the, he had a band called Random Access. It was like the pop top forty band, and and I um, sat in the chair after him. Yep, and, and he the, stayed in Dallas. And He's the other guy, great. the other guy was uh, Earl Harvin. Oh, beautiful. Oh, and and I don't know if you've ever seen Earl what he does with a kick drum pedal with one foot. Oh, that yeah, it's he, crazy. He hits it with his toe it and and then lets off and it bounces back and then he hits it with his heel yeah and it bounces back and it's like a machine gun go, 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 go. and it's and so he'll he'll with one pedal go doom, doom, da, 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 and you're like I, I, it sounds like the freehand technique it's, from Johnny Ram. Yeah, I think it's 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 kind of like I think Gad can do that a little bit, but yeah, that sounds like really fast. No, he does it like on steroids. It's yeah. it's like you think he's got a double pedal. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and it's, it's who's got the time? But no, I think I think I think Earl uh, moved to Europe. I think he's in Europe. You know, playing. Uh, he's in Copenhagen or, or Berlin or something. I don't know why he went over You know there. who else is in Europe? Sorry. The, the, anytime you bring something into ADD Who else? Who else to, is in Europe? Uh, Billy Cobham. Yeah, I think he moved to uh, Switzerland. You know, I've got, I've got... You got his kit. I've got his kit. That's nice. Um, in So I was with Reba, uh, and it was around 2010, mm-hmm. and we were getting ready to do this tour with all of these young bands. Um I can't even remember the name of them. They were yeah. open up. I think Thompson Square opened for you. Thompson time? Square, yeah. yeah. Uh, there were, and there was about five or six like really hot shot young drummers. And I had just <laughs> seen Rush. You know, I had taken my uh, my 16-year-old son to see Rush. Jim loves Rush. Who? <gasps> I love. <laughs> me too. I, I just, I just. Uh, I, w- Favorite I, Rush song, go. Uh, you can't um, pick one. You have to the whole the whole uh, Red Barchetta, you know that whole album. Yeah, yeah. Moving pictures, moving, moving pictures. Oh, yeah. the, That's I, the one. I can. I like signals too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, subdivision in the shopping malls. Mm-hmm. And then what's the one on? Uh, what's the? 
Um, What's the one on the the big money and all that stuff? No, the the twenty twelve record. Um, oh, Spirit uh, of Radio. Yeah, 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 that one. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, it's classics. Yeah, I just uh, so anyway. So I, I had just seen this, and at the time, and you know, the funny thing is, still now to this day, everybody, and I started seeing this around nineteen ninety five. You start seeing kits like that, where, you know, where it's one rack tom, one floor tom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and in 1995, it was really cool because it was different. It was grunge. Now, it's it's like somebody sent a memo out saying, all right, if you want a Nashville gig, this you've, got, you've got to have this kit and it's got to look exactly like that. And I was like, I don't want I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. And I had just seen Rush, so I yeah. thought, I want a big kit. I want a big <laughs> Yeah. Freaking. Well, you could use some of those toms and like Reba's like uh, ballads and stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, here's what I did. So I called up my Yamaha guy and I said, I said, you know what? I'm the least, you know, I just, I never asked for anything. And, <laughs> and, and I, I'm just, I'm such a low profile artist, but I want a big kit for this tour. Yeah. And I said, I don't ask for freebies a lot. Um, but now I, 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 I want a kit. Yeah. And, and and I said, I want a 24-inch kick, yeah. and I want an 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 toms. I want six toms. Nice. Four up top, two on the bottom. Something like that. And 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 so immediately you could start hearing on the other end the hemming and hawing. Ah. Wow, you know, budgets and blah, blah, blah. And I said, see what you can do. Mm-hmm. And and literally I was kind of testing him because I thought, if they're not going to help me, I'm going to go find somebody else. Who was will. the guy at the time? It not was John, John Whitman. John Whitman, I know. John I know. John is a wonderful, wonderful And player. you're still with Yamaha. How many years? Uh, since 01. Okay, great. Since 01. Nice, man. Nice yeah. So it's a double kick? Nice run. Double, it, okay, so let me. Let, you, this will explain everything. So two weeks later, he calls me. Tommy, mm-hmm. you're not going to believe what happened. I just had a kit turned in, and uh, it's got everything that you said. Uh, it's turned in by an artist. Uh, less than two years old, not a scratch on it. Tons of hardware. He even sent the cases. That's and, so sweet. And he said, if you don't mind having a kit that was owned by Billy Cobham. Yeah, you say, I'll take it. And I went, I almost started crying because I literally, as a kid, I remember falling asleep with my cost headphones on to Spectrum. I listened to Spectrum thousands of times. And I still, to this day, a couple of weeks ago, I, w- I was feeling nostalgic. I went back and listened to Mendocino and yeah. Spectrum and all these. Red Baron and all. Oh. You know, you know, and he had that record, <clears throat> Funky Thad of Sings, mm-hmm. with, the, with the ape on it. Yeah. Um, but no, something tells me he got to play more singles on it than you did. Hey, here's, a, here's some trivia for you. Uh, who played bass on the Spectrum record? Lee Sklar. Not Very bad. Good. I'm a Very liner good. notes guy. Yeah. Hey, Tommy, I got to tell you this. You are a product of music education. You studied with Ed Sof. You know how to... <laughs> score and arrange strings voices probably horns the whole deal you're classically trained we got two locations of the school of rock here in nashville and they're the sponsor of this show my friends angie and kelly mccray they've had the school of rock here in nashville for nearly a decade there's 250 locations around the globe they're one of the top locations man and they're cranking out super awesome kids right jim that can sing and play keyboards and bass and guitar and not only they're learning a musical instrument that they can take with them for the rest of their lives they're learning cool life skills like how to get along in a group how to take direction how to work as part of a team how to take on assignments how to be persistent face uh, adversity they're doing great things Uh, I, i hosted an event at the rhyme and it was an awesome fundraiser and it was smooth as glass because the students there they're from three to 18 years old. Mm-hmm. And it's right here. So if the parents want to get their kids involved in something like a team sport, you want to get them away from Siri, you want to get them away from the Nintendo, something real, something tangible, get them to the School of Rock Nashville. Two locations, Nashville at schoolofrock.com or Franklin at schoolofrock.com. School of Rock, thank you for sponsoring our show. They All don't right. learn music to put on shows. They put on shows to learn music. You know what? That's, uh, I got a kid that, well, I've got lots of kids. I've yeah. got one of everything. You have, uh, yes. I have, what I do have you s- call being a parent with, with six? Is you're a sex father? You're a we, sex... We, uh, sex we call it uh, being breeders. <laughs> <laughs> it's called being broke. So how does that work? Do you guys just plan on it or do you go just release it to the gods? We, we do call it that as yeah. well. So. You release it to the gods and you're like, whatever we, happens is whatever happens. Yeah, it's 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 always an adventure. It's always an adventure. Uh, my youngest now is 12 mm-hmm. 
And man, you should hear him play drums. It would blow your mind. And I've, I mean, I literally probably maybe given him like three lessons. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, it's part of his DNA. He's a Circus Survive nut. That's what he, he goes down as a, and, and man, the drum parts on Circus Survive is, they're insane. Yeah. It, it's like the modern day rush. I don't know that band. Circus Survive. Oh, uh, unbelievable drummer. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Now look at some of the guys you've recorded with. Alan Jackson, Reba, Big and Rich, Waylon Jennings, Jessica Simpson. The list goes on and on. And you've cut number one songs for um, Justin Moore, D uh, Dustin Lynch, James Otto. And you were in the movie Muscle Shoals on Netflix. And then you do a thing on YouTube called um, The Five Minute Monday. You still doing that? Um, I'm getting ready to launch that again. Yeah. And um, and in I, five minutes, you say, this is how you tune your drums. This is how you play with a click. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're uh, and, and I, I can't believe the amount of flack I've gotten from people that it's like some of them will go for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, this is supposed to be five minutes. I'm like, I'll just give you five bonus minutes of stuff. And yeah. you're complaining? Don't be a jerk. This is free what content. What's the deal with these people? The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Well, our big tagline has been inspiring kids to rock on stage and in life. We changed it actually to inspiring the world to rock on stage and in life because when kids are here, they learn so much more than music. They learn how to be on a team. They learn responsibility. They learn to take responsibility for their actions. They learn to organize their time. And we try to teach them, you know, not to be that person that nobody wants to be on a tour bus with. <laughs> Connect with School of Rock today. Search School of Rock Franklin or Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. People on the internet, they're such trolls. Oh, oh they, man. They, no, they're not. Huh? Well, I mean, no, no. Troll. <laughs> I mean they, really, they really can be because they can hide behind their thing. I was looking at also at your bio. These are things like, you know, we both, uh, you know, over the years, you're, you're in Nashville long enough. You're going to write songs. You're going to play drums on television. You know, when you do the Tonight Shows and the Letterman's and the Today Shows and all that, the voice and the view. Um, but you played at the White House and you played at the Kennedy Center and you did the Capitol on the lawn the 4th of July. And those are three things I cannot has, claim. Has Jason not done that? No, we... Um, do you know how many people? Yet. Do you know how many people show up for that? The the Fourth of July, almost a million. With the Boston wow. Symphony, yeah. did you guys do it with the Boston Symphony? Or? Well, it, no, it was. I think it was the like the Washington Symphony. Maybe it was the Boston Symphony. I've got this great picture though of uh, that somebody took of the the one of the violinists. I think it might have been the first chair like going like this. No, he had a handkerchief hanging out of his ear. Yeah, because the, the drums, volume, the drums were too. Oh, loud. They, the string when when it's pop day mm -hmm. with the orchestra, they, they hate, hate it. They hate drums. because they have to really, really. Uh, first of all, they probably don't like playing the simple eighth note parts, dee, do, dee, do, dee, do, yeah. right? But at the same time, they're you're, they're by the drums, and usually you're behind a blast shield. But they hate it. They they. And sometimes they have to play with clicks or... <laughs> but I tell you what, that, that was a fun show. That, yeah. that, that was an amazing show. I ended up keeping the sticks and signing them to myself just to put them in a, in a frame one oh, of these yeah. days. When Glass I, uh, what do you call it? A shadow box them. Yeah, That's right. yeah, one of these days. And I've, I've got a stick that Ringo signed. I'm still supposed to be doing that. That was in 1991. So. Nice. Gringo yeah. star. That's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, Greg Morrow's email address. Gringo star yeah. at Mac.com. Yeah. Um, we hope that uh, Greg does well today. He's on, he's having a surgery today. What, he's getting what? a new hip. No kidding. Yeah. You know, uh, we're all robotic. I got, I'm filled with mesh. You know, Matt Pearson <laughs> just got two new knees. Really? Last week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hey, they're new. Yeah. It's great. It's probably titanium, Whew. but he's, it slows down your airport travel because you're like, I have metal in my body. I had no idea he was getting a uh, hip replacement. Um, Allison Presswood had that done, and she said it was the best thing she ever did. Yeah, you know what? I have to gotta get my I gotta get my cataracts removed. Cataracts too young for that, bro. But apparently, it happens. It can happen as early as thirty. Wow, you know. And I'm about to have my fiftieth, and so in six months, I'm gonna have my fiftieth. So I'll send you the invite. There's gonna be midgets, fire trucks, strippers. The Nashville scene's gonna be there. Am I invited? Of course. Okay. Bring your slip-ons. Um, you, you're going to be the stripper. <laughs> That's right. Or the midget. Yeah. <laughs> My girlfriend's listening going, 
Strippers, really? So I was going to maybe play a, a verse and chorus of some of these awesome songs that you've played drums on. You know, this is a big responsibility. You move here, you know, with your dreams. The first year you get a great job. You're getting more and more connected in the studio. Before you know it, you're hearing yourself on the radio all the time. You're making money and you're making other people's dreams come true. This is the greatest job in the world. You know, it's the weirdest thing sitting in a Cracker Barrel or in a anywhere and and talking to someone and then all of a sudden going, yeah. oh, I hear myself. I played on that. Yeah, Lee Bryce's yeah. Hard to Love comes on. Let's yeah. check it out, Jim. This is the epitome of boom schmack, dude. Love it. I have it. Remind me, I have a great story about this song. That's the uh, bat in the birthday cake sound. I am insensitive. I have a tendency to pay more attention to the things that I need. Sometimes I drink too much. Sometimes I test your trust. Sometimes I don't know why you stay with me. I'm hard to love, hard to love. Oh, I don't make it easy. That's a good song. I couldn't do it if I stood away. I'm hard to love, hard to love And you say that you need me Well, I don't deserve it But I love that you love me good Is that you shaking the tambourine too? That's one of those crack tempos Where eighth notes or sixteenths work but then sometimes you have to ask the producer, what do you like better? Yeah. You know, because like Dingu Gago Dingu works too. Yeah. And could be just the right color. But it, if it's too dega dega dega, it makes it too happy. Well, many, many times I will do uh, eighth notes on the first chorus and sixteenths on the second oh, I chorus. I like that. And that way it gives them the option to chop it up later. Than and then on the last chorus, you can add a slight accent. Yeah. And there, and I do this other uh, technique on the tambourine. Yeah, I learned it uh from playing in the black gospel choirs. I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen it where you turn the hand like that. Oh, I would love to learn that. It's insane. Yeah, because uh, Stanton Moore does that. Yeah. And the, but I think the first guy to kind of like do it and make it popular was uh, Jack Ashford with all the Motown records. Yeah. So what's the funny story about Lee Bryce? Okay, so I completely had forgotten what happened that day. We, we, we cut that one and I think I drive your truck in the same session. Did you record them as demos that got upgraded or were they... Uh, no, no, we, we cut the, those at Ocean Way. Because you and I are on a, a Lee Bryce record where there was a lot of demos that got up, upgraded. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, that's that they do that a lot. Mm -hmm. And which is why you never, ever treat a song like a demo. You, never play bad guys. Yeah, you don't suck because you just never know. Always play like it's the last supper. Uh, I, I, I ended up on... Taylor Swift's Fearless record from doing that. Hey, they upgraded nice. like three demos. That's a good feather in the cap. Yeah. I hope you're writing all this stuff down for your bio. <laughs> Who's going to yeah. play you? What actor plays you in your biopic? Uh, definitely a uh, uh, Matt Dame, I think. Matt Dame for sure. <laughs> no, Hickey Rose the beard out. Clooney. The beard out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. or Chris Leonardo. Dame. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, so um we it, it's literally like about quarter to 5. Mm -hmm. Sessions going to 5. Um, the songwriter was also at the time the A and R guy at Curb. Um, Who's that? John Osier. Oh yeah, I like no John. Yeah, he's a wonderful person. Um, John. Apparently, it was it was a different feel, like, and and it's just one of those situations where it just wasn't clicking, mm -hmm. and um, and we kept playing it, kept playing it. John and it was like, we got to get this, we got to get this, and Lee was like, man, nah, I, I hate it. And, and they don't want to pay overtime. So. And, and so Matt McClure, the producer slash engineer said, guys, let's take a five minute break. And they, they came down into the cutting room and I'm, and I pulled out that snare drum and I was actually given that snare drum. A friend of mine was rehabbing a house and found it. What is it? It's a, like a 1983 uh, Yamaha recording birch, oh, six yes. and a half uh, by 14. And it's just one of these gush guys. It does the gush thing and that's it. That's it, all. It's all it does. And birch, six and a half. Yeah. I'm and, going and, to look for one. And, and, and if, <laughs> if you go on my Instagram page, you'll see pictures of it and mm -hmm. it looks like it's been through a war. It's yeah. got like six different colors of duct tape on it. And it's, yeah. you know, so I, I, I get real sentimental and almost supernatural kind of about the, about the gush drum. Like if it's working, don't change the head. Yeah. yeah. Well, so Matt, I, I pull that drum out and I'm start, I start changing the feel. It's like radically changing the feel. 
And because uh, I think it was a bit faster, and it, and it was like a you know don't gosh don't don't guy or something oh, like no. and it just and so I said Matt come here, and um, I said what if we change the feel to this? And I started playing that you know, four on the floor, don't don't don't, and his eyes got this big, and he went, guys, suit back up, please. This is it, and we got it in one take. God, I wish they gave you writing credit. Mm-hmm. Now, guys that are listening, the only thing that qualifies as writing credit is chords and lyrics and melody. Mm-hmm. If you come up with 50 ways to leave a lover, which was the, your version of that, this mm-hmm. is this it changed the whole song. Yeah. You're not getting paid. You're only mm-hmm. getting paid one time. So you got to write songs, but that is you saved the day, you helped it to, and you helped that process. Yeah. Awesome. Another one that was really really huge for you was if I had to choose between Big and Rich is Lost in This Moment, which is the number 1 or something about a truck, Kip Moore. Which one would you play? You know play? what? I would love for you to play. Yeah, tell me. Uh, Winona, a song called Attitude. All see right. if you can find it. Attitude. One of my favorite tracks I've ever that. played on. And this was actually written by John Rich. Oh, nice. Now, for those listeners out there, John Rich is the guy that wrote Hicktown, Amarillo Sky, and a million number one songs. Save for a Horse, Ride a Cowboy. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, but he was very, very instrumental in helping out. But Dean. even Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy is his most popular song. It only... It didn't go to number one. No, but the, the, only, the video was a game changer. Yes. For our industry. Yes. You know, whenever you have midgets and mannequins um, dancing and mm-hmm. a marching band. Yeah, but Lost in this Moment did go to number one, which was their, I think their only number one hit. I it was a that. wedding song. Yeah. yeah. How's the, uh, I got this attitude right here. Let me know if this is the one. Call and response. I took a rocket ride across the sky a couple times till the fire burned down. Well, I hit the ground a time or two. Will Ferrell's in there. I got back up and I found the truth and said, hey. What a great mix, too, man. Nice. Yeah. That's a crystal clear mix. That was a Dan Huff production. Uh, uh, I guess Justin Ebeck they mixed it, but man, what a great. Oh, Justin Ebeck knows gets, how to mix it. He gets drums. He really gets drums. Oh, yeah, Dan does. And, and Justin is, woo, he can mix. Yeah. Fantastic. You know, and the funny thing is I've seen him. I've watched him mix. He, all he has is an SSL console. But yeah. There's nothing else. He really is a master. And, uh, you know, we talk about true believers. Justin Ebank was one of the first guys to take a chance on me early on, 1999. Right around the time I met you, I was playing in a, um, you as well, we're playing with some, uh, this thing called La Femme Q Rock, which was all these rock chicks. You and I both played with Linda Regan, yeah, and we that. were using... Akai samplers with floppy disks. <laughs> and and I would say, hey, Tommy, I need to grab the floppies, man. And I would drive over and you would, you're like, man, I'm so busy today. I got, I got sessions. I got to drop my six kids off. To, and then you would pass this <laughs> floppy disk to me and I would go rock with this girl for like $45. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if she's playing music anymore. I don't know, but she's such a sweetheart. She was so nice. And so she was one of the original divas. She was such a diva. Oh, when Star Wars opened, um, we did a gig at 12th and Porter, and she came out on stage with fish, fishnet hose wielding a lightsaber. Wow. It was like anything goes. And we would do a Spanish song, and she would come out, and she would have the mask on and everything. Yep. Very dramatic. Yep. Fun. You know, it's fun to do different stuff. I mean, that's not going to happen in a Jason Aldean show or a Alabama show. Mm, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I want to see those guys in fishnet stuff. I like that Winona, man. Give, give and, it time. And, you and never know. Cactus was in that band Highway 101. They were great. They recorded all that stuff over at uh, Treasure Isle back in the day. I lo- I did my first big Nashville record at Treasure Isle. I had High no, ceilings. No business 
playing on that high profile of a record yeah. at that young. I mean, I was so green. Yeah. And and uh, it was for Rodney Crowell was producing. It was a uh, Brady Seals first solo record. Nice. What was that like working with uh, Rodney? It was it was like uh, I was like I you know you, you know the the whole thing. Uh, a lot of high achiever people always feel like people are going to one day find out that they're a phony. Oh, the imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah, the imposter syndrome. And so I'm th- I'm sitting here going, guys, you don't understand. I don't I should not be here. You know, the, the Stuart Smith was playing guitar, Michael Rose was on bass. And I was like, I don't I'm not supposed to. Wait be. a minute, but did you were thinking that? I was only thinking that. Good. And I, uh, on the outside, I was you know, it was like it was like a duck with the feet going like Yeah, yeah. And I was like, uh, you know, oh, oh yeah, man, that's great. Sounds good, man. Yeah. I was cool, but but in, on the inside I was going just make it through this. Don't let them know that I should be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did, what did, uh, what's his name? The keyboard player? Uh, uh, who? Stevie. Oh, Steve King. Steve King. Uh, did you ever work with Steve King back in the day? He was like a keyboard player and um, we did so much early work together. We were, uh, in, demos. Uh, we were in a big Kenny's band on Hollywood records. And then he went on to play with Keith Urban for five years. And he was like, yeah, uh, the music business is like a recording session is like two hours and 58 minutes of sitting around and two minutes of sheer terror <laughs> you are not joking i mean yeah. it's like it's like I'm, you're getting paid double scale master to sit and read a magazine and then uh, you're up yeah ah. no. yeah just like the actor that waits in his trailer for eight hours but, i mean and, did you ever feel that rich terror yeah um I think the first recording session I did um, in town, I didn't know the Nashville number system. I learned it on the fly. I mean, we didn't have Chaz's book. We didn't have Jim Riley's book. And and, and I think, uh, you know, one of the musicians on said, no big deal, kid. It's every number is just the, is, you know, C, C major is the one chord, F major. And then if you could change the key, it's like movable dough. Every time you see the number, there's four beats. You just watch the harmony go by and you come up with your drum part. Like, no problem. And then have you noticed, like, over the years, like, some guys that are band leaders they'll just write lick or riff mm-hmm. and then some guys are like overly detailed and they have like all the fret and the, every note labeled you know some guys are they write better charts mm-hmm. some are bare bones and some are very very detailed yep. I read a lot of Adam Schoenfeld charts and they are super neat mm-hmm. and super spelled out I tell you one, one, one uh, hint if you're going to write a national chart always number the lines Oh, so like uh, measure one, two, three, four, five. Well, ten. Just, just like the first line, it's it's line one. Second line's line. Because, oh, yeah. Because it saves you so much time. Because at the end of the song, hey, will you give me the third the third bar of line three? And oh. boom, the 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 engineer knows. Instead of word. saying two, give me two bars before the bridge. But yeah, yeah, two bars for, or give me the give me uh, the third bar of the verse, and then they go to the wrong verse. Mm-hmm. You know? So it's like. It just it just saves so much time. Yeah, and for the musicians that are hungry for knowledge and are thinking about moving to this super popular city called Nashville, or you're just uh, somebody that just loves music, here's the deal. Uh, that Hard to Love song was recorded in 15 minutes and it went on to be a number one song. So the things that are happening here in Nashville, you've got musicians that are incredibly intuitive, incredibly gifted, and cr- incredibly professional, and the rate that we record here is very fast. It's... Uh, I bring people here, uh, or I have people come to sessions and watch them. Uh, and anybody from outside of Nashville, you know, if they're from New York or LA or London or Sweden or wherever, oh, wow. they come here and their jaw hits the ground because uh, it's so efficient. Yeah, we, we go in the control room, no one's heard the song, mm-hmm. pass out the charts. The guys, they play the work tapes. Some of the guys are talking about football. Mm-hmm. you know half pay attention what'd you do over the weekend how's the boat how's yeah, the wife yeah. yeah and you know and you know which kind of puts off some new newer writers and then uh you know the writers will go well i want, I want this to be between tom petty and the stone or whatever yeah, yeah you know? do the cold play on the bridge yeah yeah you know well or or the nashville version skull play yeah so. skull play. <laughs> yeah or, go or, to the, or rodeo head you know on the bridge you're <laughs> on the bridge you're either gonna ride the toms or ride the bell <laughs> Or Imagine Wagons, my yeah. other favorite one. <laughs> Imagine Wagons. That's funny. So, so go ahead. <clears throat> anyway, so we're like, okay, boom, go out, first take, bam, done. We're, I mean, you know, and and there are many sessions that we that you do and I do that they get six songs in three hours. Yeah. That's yeah. thirty minutes a song, yeah. and that's for overdubs and everything. I know we yeah. both worked for. I believe you both worked for Keith Falaze. Mm-hmm. We used to do seven a session, so twenty-one songs a day. Your brain hurts because. Yeah. 
he's keeping the first pass of drums. Yeah. And so the pressure's on. And so then when everyone goes to do their fixes or layer the mando or, or layer a high string, you're picking up maracas and tambourine. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, and, and the drive home, you're just like, you know, what a zombie, you know, I know time for a glass of red wine. So let me ask you this. Um, not only are you a multi-talent and a drummer that brings songs to life, you're a recording artist and you and your wife, Lori have a record deal on render records. We used to, Oh, we, we don't anymore. Where's lost hollow sign. Now we are uh, actually in between deals right now. We there's, uh, we, there have been rumors that we've been hearing that there, there are a couple people that are interested in us. And that's we, great. We're just kind of going Indie about man. It. We're going about it as, you know, as if it's not going to happen, we're just going to do it ourselves. Does, um, is everybody interested in hearing you sing? I think the answer is, yeah, it's check this out. Indeed. Sorry. You're on the uh, second verse. I like how you guys switch off. Yeah. You and your bride. And I'm playing acoustic guitar on this too. Nice. I dreamed again this evening. We were lost upon a black and endless sea. Clinging to the pieces of the wrecked remains that once was you and me No north star to guide us, no rudder true to point us to dry land you write these things together? Yeah, we write them together. Then it's darkness uh, over. It's in our we're recording me. in our home studio. Yeah. Desperately Beautiful. Mix them at that, mix them ourselves. Get ready for Tommy to sing. We're gonna go a little longer on this one. The quiet night oh, is restless, yeah. and I'm rise by the rhythm of your sleep. There's a world of hurt between us, like a castle wall I know I'll never breach. I wanna take us back to the simple time when we were all we knew. The subtle, strong, hypnotic tide has slowly pulled me out too far from you. Yeah, man, Don Henley in the house. Is it funny? Is it fun to step away from the drums and come into that role? You know, it's it's uh, it, it is heaven uh, uh, being a, a co lead singer of a of a duo. Um, with someone you my, love. my wife and I, I mean, it is like where our minds are mitted together when we sing. Pe yeah. People come up and say, this is the tightest harmonies I've ever heard. That's nice. And we well, got uh, all the time in the world to practice together. Yeah. We, we talk about pillow talk. Yeah. Well, we, you know what? We, we've been, it took us a long time to learn to sing together and to work together in the, in the home studio and a lot of tears. And, you know, I, I've become a lot more patient and a lot less perfectionist. You mean like, just the kid gloves you have to wear in producing someone you're married to? Yeah, I mean, you you have a tendency, I think, because you're married to this person to to take the filter off, you know, mm. and talk to him like, you know, oh, what are you doing, you know? Yeah. And, and you, where you you wouldn't talk to a demo singer like that. Right. So, but <clears throat> but we we're pretty good at it now and we 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 write so much now. We're we're getting ready to get into the sync world. We we've just got six songs in a movie that's in production right now in Scotland. Nice. And two songs in the same director asked us to write uh, a song for a documentary that's getting ready to, to go on the BBC. Congratulations. Yeah. And yeah, we had, we had a guest on Michael Elsner, who's a great composer. Michael Elsner is my bud, and I'm bound to determine to help him get 
uh, a like job, a road gig. Yeah. Well, that's his dream. <laughs> he's got a he's got a dream job, which is like making good money composing music. But he's like, my life will not be complete until I ride that damn bus. It's, I'm going to. I'm bound to determine. I'm going to. I, I try. I'm, I, I, I'm always looking for something because he's a, he's just a he's fun. He's nice. He's a good looking guy. He plays all those styles. I don't he, get it. He's he's he is a genius. Yeah. He is a, he is, and he's he's been really helping us. Uh, with the licensing get metadata, our, get, our, get our sync act together. He knows metadata. Yeah, see, that's that's well, you put me in front of a spreadsheet, and I'm like a cow staring at a new gate. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> what now? Your wife uh, reminded me a lot of um, if Martina McBride and Karen Carpenter had a child. She nice, she I tell people that she is kind of a cross between uh, Karen Carpenter. And Carol King, nice. And her, her big her big influences. And speaking of Carol King, you know, um, she and I have, you wrote a song together, didn't we, you? We wrote a song for uh, her. We we wrote we got two songs on Reba's duets record mm. in uh, 08. Nice. And one of the duets we wrote was uh, was for uh, we originally wrote it for for like a Keith Urban duet, and that was right around the first time Keith went into rehab. Mm -hmm. So we put this big guitar solo on it and, and we target wrote it for it uh, at the, at the time Reba was the national spokesperson for Habitat for Humanity. So we target wrote a song about that. And the third verse was them giving the keys away to the family and everybody's crying. So we thought, uh, well, this is, you know, hopefully this song has a shot. So I, I had found out she was going to LA to cut with, uh, it was Lee Sklar, Russ Kunkel, nice Michael Thompson. I mean, it was like the all. It was like Carol King's band, nice. you know, way back in the day. Yeah, and um, I was like, dang man, I wish I could. I wish I could play on that. And that day, when I found out, I, I get an email from her, and it says, "Hey, I'm thinking about cutting Everyday People with Carol King." And Lori said, "I screamed like a Girl Scout on fire." <laughs> I was like, Carol Gang. And to this day, um, it is the only song. And a friend of mine met her at a party, the guy that was the publisher, one mm -hmm. of the publishers of our co-writer. And he talked to Carol about it. And Carol, and Carol said this, um, said, that is the only song uh, that I've ever performed that I've never written. Wow. That's such an honor to you guys. I mean, Carol King, I danced at my wedding to... You've got a friend with oh, my yeah. mom. She was. A, she is. She is a super genius. She's an American icon. Yeah. Can I find that Carol King? Yeah, it's called Everyday People. Oh my god! And that's uh, like Russ Kunkel and uh, and Lee Sklar. Uh, and Lee Sklar. No, yeah. yeah, they they that was the uh, Ronstadt rhythm section from back in the day. Yeah. College kids turning 21 in their senior year. Spring break was here. They headed south, but not for sun. On their skin, where the storms had been. It was hard fixing windows and shingles and doors. Sorry, bud. Wrong button. singing that song at uh, Doctor said good news we caught it too. short turnaround yeah yeah no turnaround is the new turnaround <laughs> they, they sung that at the Kennedy Center Honors uh, that was televised on NBC that's nice one year and that that was the song that they did that's a good check um, yeah the president was there and well it, it the check never showed up and we're like did you have to call him 
I finally called them and said, the song's called Everyday People. They sent it to Sly and the Family Stone. Ah! You know, they're everyday people. They're, yeah. They're song called Everyday People. That's crazy. Like, no, it wasn't Sly and the Family Stone. That's an interesting clerical problem. Yeah. And so, but they recut the check. They did. We They literally cut a check. We went and picked it up. So. You don't have to send Nunzio or Carmine after him and be like, oh, if you were you, I would actually get on this right now. Hey. You know what I'm saying? You know? <laughs> Man, well, that's, a, and that's 2007? Yeah. So... You, you and Lori have been writing for a while. We've been writing for a long time. In fact, we're, we've gotten to the point where, you know, it takes a while in Nashville to get your lyric leg. I call it lyric legs. Sure. Uh, Nashville is brutal on for lyrics. lyrics. I mean, they they will chew you up and spit you out. Yeah, for rock and roll, it's all about the riffs and you can barely hear the vocal, you know, yeah. what they're it, saying. In, for, that, in Nashville, the lyric right here. is everything. And everything. so it really took us years of... of you know, and you and you'll write with a with one person. You know, you'll write with a Michael Delaney or a Craig Wiseman or something like that. And you're like, oh, I like that trick. And you write that trick down, put it in your little toolbox. And so, but we've gotten to the point now where we we write probably half the songs by ourselves. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, the the songs that have gotten cut, uh, like the song on the documentary. Um, they asked for one song. We wrote three just to give ourselves a better chance. And the they, Muscle Shoals documentary. No, no, the uh, the one in the on the BBC that's coming up this year. Gotcha, gotcha. And so uh, we ended up writing all three of those by ourselves. Uh, the the one that they didn't cut, we put on our our new record. Our new record. Oh, nice. What is, and what is it called? It's called uh, Looking for Happy. That's your copy. Lost Hollow, Looking for Happy. And uh, I was just working with Mark Hill yesterday. Beautiful. I love Mark. Man. Yeah, Mark, uh, genius Beautiful. session studio based god. and um, So easy to work with. And he, he played on a couple songs in this record. And uh, he said, you know, I was taking a trip uh, to Indiana and I had about six CDs in there. And he said, I had never listened to this song all the way, or this CD all the way through. And he said he listened to it and just was like, you know, he was gushing. It was great. Beautiful. Is that yeah. something you can get on iTunes and stuff? Yeah, that's on iTunes, okay. Spotify, whatever. Nice. So, you know, it's so funny. I get so many CDs from people and I go, I don't have a CD player. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have totally drank the Kool-Aid with the kids. I'm all digital. Well, you know, the funny thing, uh, being an artist, <clears throat> you know, mer- selling merch is a big thing and selling CDs is a big thing. Sure. And around 2016, they stopped putting CD players in cars. Yeah. And, and so, many, so many people complained about it that they're starting to put CD players back in oh, cars again. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, because, you know... Uh, a lot of people in in like an older demographic, they want to buy something at a at a show. They want to buy a CD. They want something tangible. Yeah. Wow, it's going to come back. Yeah. yeah. It's That's interesting it. you talk about the songwriting aspect of Nashville and how they're brutal on lyrics. It's almost their themes and little, you know, when we first got here in 05, the thing to do was the storytelling in the song. And that mm-hmm. kind of had a resurgence. And then after a while, there was a twist to every song. Mm-hmm. Right. There was always like, you know, like an M night Shyamalan moment. Yeah. There was always, you know, something play on words yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And now, you know, now there's no lyrics. It's just like hip hop. Well, once yeah. uh, when, after follow, say wrote, um, the way you love me, then there were mods in every song. Modulations. It's like, yeah. it's like pe- people, they kind of zig, you know, faith somebody song. zigs and everybody zags. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And follows these kids have gone on to do some fun things with their bands and stuff, you know. Oh yeah, but you get you get a, a band, and this is interesting because you said a lot of people, a lot of the artists, you know, uh, you mentioned something here. I wrote it down, and it was um, an artist is shooting themselves in the foot trying to write every song themselves. I was under the impression that like a, a band like Zach Brown, don't they write all, all their own they, stuff? They write a lot, I'm sure, but I th- I'm sure they bring in some outside talents to give them a third party perspective. Okay. You know, because some people are just they're really strong with melody or big picture, or but maybe maybe they're not the great lyric, the greatest lyric writers. But I mean, in my opinion, that band was one of the their power was in the the lyrics of the song, mm-hmm. very powerfully written songs and very well performed songs. You know, I mean, it, I always does. I, I it, it, they felt very personal. Yeah, I had the drummer Chris at one of my <clears throat> camps. Yeah. Um, I don't know how they structure everything. A very interesting band, a lot of mouths to feed. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah. almost Eight like a, guys or like, something. It's like a big that's, band. That's why we're a duo. Yeah, <laughs> and we're married. <laughs> Kick it off, man. Yeah, yeah. Two guitars. Mm-hmm. I love that. So now, what about your what about your kids? What do you like? Are they, some of them are interested in music? Are they, you encouraging them to go to college? Is that are you staunch like you're going to college or like what, what's that? No, like? no, no. I, I co- college doesn't mean what it used to anymore to me. It's it's. It doesn't guarantee anything. Right. So I, I tell my kids, uh, you do what your passion is. Nice. Find what your passion is 
and do it. And that way it's not work. Good parenting. Yeah. And, and we've never really pushed our kids into music, but they've just followed us into it. And so every, do. every single one of them sing, uh, my 23 year old son, who's an airline mechanic now, uh, he's learning to fly. He's getting his pilot's license. Uh, he is a great drummer. He was, uh, he played in our band lost hollow and I'd be out front, you know, playing guitar and w- which was fascinating because becoming a lead singer in a band, it, it, it taught me so much about what, what a lead singer wants from a drummer that yes. you don't get when you're sitting in the drum chair. Yes. Because it, when you're sitting in the drum chair, you're thinking about drums. When you're up front, you're thinking about, you know, push me, push me. Don't push me too too much. You know, don't speed up. So it's like it, it's like you want to, you know, what I was always wanting from drummers um, was lay it down. I mean, I want to make sure that it's the right tempo. Once I know it's the right tempo, lay it down, lay down the law, push me a little bit, but don't push me too much. Yes. And and so and my son was he was so good at that. He had this backside of the beat in Memphis kind of feel that you can't teach people. Nope. But man, and I would always be like, come on, speed up, Taylor. And then I'd see a video of it later. And I'd be like, oh, oh no, it, it, was fine. It, it wasn't, it wasn't him. It was me. I was, <laughs> r- I was rushing like a drugged racehorse. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> wow. And so for all the drum nerds in the audience, um, what are your companies? Yamaha. Yamaha, um, uh, Sabian Symbols. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Andy Zildjian is just, you, I mean, you're, you're Sabian guy. Yeah. Um, Vic Firth, I love Vic Firth. Nice sticks. Uh, Joe Testa is just a genius. Uh, I, I love that company. And uh, I've, I've got like a Taylor guitar nice. endorsement. You're a Remo guy? I, I am, but but I just never used it because, uh, you know, honestly, by the time you pay for shipping and everything, I, it's just as cheap to go to guitar. So center. so does um, Alabama buy your, your, your sundries that you need, like your sticks and your heads and stuff? Or is yeah. it on? Okay, nice. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, they're, they're pretty good about that yeah, stuff. Yeah, when you finally get on a huge tour, it's like, hey, we're this is this is a millions and millions of dollars are coming in here. Can you please buy my sticks and heads? Doesn't add up to much no. over at, in the big picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what are you really excited about? What's what's making you excited? What does your next five years look like? Um, I want to score movies. Oh, you're going to go full circle and I come wanna, back to your skill sets. I want to score movies. I just bought, like last week, uh, the all the sample libraries they've got. So good now. They've got... Uh, it's insane. It's yeah, insane. Any of Michael Elsner stuff? Um, yes, I'm gonna probably do uh, like I'm, I want to do some movie uh, trailer records. Yeah, yeah. Um, and put some live drums on them too. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean because I I've, I've got a studio, might as well, you know. Right. And uh, but I just got last week. Uh, I bought everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was all on sale. So, like strings, samples, and horn I, I samples, got, like and... LA scoring strings, and uh, I got the entire orchestra stuff uh, and uh, saxophones of of just libraries that absolutely blew my. And so, we, I do a lot of production work at home. Yeah, pro, I'm always producing two or three different things. Yeah, we have a mutual friend that won't pay you. Yes, yes, we're, we're gonna do. have to go get uh, hey, Carmine and Nunzio, oh, no, get the vice, on. and you, mm. you know, you know. What about what do I make you laugh? <laughs> Am I funny? This to happens you? sometimes, you know, and it's very disappointing. It, it does. It it, it kind of takes the wind out of your sails for a while, especially when you've got six kids to feed. Does that happen often? Um, no, no, not not. I mean, I'd say in the in the X amount of years I've been here, probably about two or three times. You try to get money up front if you can, or a front, a half on the front, half on the back. I've been screwed on voiceover jobs for sure. Yeah. Anyways, so so isn't it funny that you can spend all that money on on something that is virtual? It's software. It's not even real. Mm-hmm. It, it's like credit card, PayPal, boom, and then you download this software, and it's not real. Yeah, it's crazy. But the funny thing is, um, I I just did a commercial at home for Jewelry Television, um, and they wanted a certain artist. Uh, they wanted me to model the song after a certain artist, and it had a brass, like a live brass section on it. And uh, man, I, I the the sounds that I got. There's a guy in town that that is like my he's like my guru. Yeah. For for uh, the mock up thing, and he does it so well that he's actually he's actually played stuff back in the studio, and like a trumpet player and a violinist will be in there arguing over who the players are. <laughs> I mean that's 
that, that he's he's actually mocked up full records and they went why are we replacing this and and they just keep it mm-hmm. so he's he's like my guru he's you know i call him and go larry please show me how to do this yeah and he did he does bless his heart so yeah man oh man it's so exciting yeah we had paul lyman here and he said that he does some production work and That's what I was trying he to put some of. strings and horns on something <clears> and <throat> and they th- and a lot of the members of the national symphony thought it was they were real musicians so really? we're at that point uh, you know i hate to say it uh, and and it happens with drums i mean sure the, the, right now i tell people the biggest my biggest competitors in town are the laptop yeah you know because they're they're the i call it laptop country well laptop composers have have uh, taken i mean well when you and i were running around doing three demo sessions a day with with two drum sets Mm ping-ponging it's gone i mean jerry rose doing some of it michael miles mcpherson and you got some of these young guard kids that i love to death that have come in that are like keeping the spirit alive i think but i it's definitely changed but it's it's not it's not what it was i mean i sat down one day and I figured I tried to figure out how many sessions I had done and in your life, in my life. How did, and you tried to do that in one afternoon. I, I well, I, I went pretty solid for about probably like 13, 14 years mm-hmm. at, at about the same pace. Right. And we're talking like 500 sessions a year. I mean, nice. as, as many as you physically wanted to do and stay married. Yes. You know, so well, you um, get to sleep in your own bed, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I figured it out and, and it roughly somewhere between seven and 10,000 sessions. That's great. Oh uh, Buddy Harmon was 18,000. Buddy so. Harmon was the first time I played the Opry and I, I, we were the next, I was the next drummer after Buddy. So yeah. I was standing right behind him and they started playing Pretty Woman. Yeah. And I couldn't move. I was like, that's the beat. I mean, that's the beat. That's, no, no, that's, yeah. oh my God. Yeah. It's like that, essentially a Motown beat. That's not, just the beat it's the beat that was on the record because he played it he played mm. it yeah and this is what is super eye-opening is that i believe you know D- dina and jeff carter their dad played guitar on crying and pretty woman wow now that session for both those songs paid 50 dollars. wow that's that's uh, there's a lot of injustice in the whoa yeah. you know and all the motown guys that that don't get to participate in the sag after fun mm-hmm. you know, and they um, get sampled left and right james brown's drummers get sampled left and right it's so interesting we have to try to protect ourselves when we can but we can't predict technology no you you really just uh you, you just got to make the best music that you can and just keep plowing on and 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 uh you know one of my pinterest boards uh has got little motivational things and, the, and it talks about multiple streams of income yes you know uh, you know how to how to retire wealthy have, have multiple streams of income you've almost got to got to do that in the music industry to make a living you, mm-hmm. you can't just do one thing anymore so what, what is this you're on pinterest or you follow this page on pinterest uh, just just i've got pinterest pages and oh. one of them is like uh, my dream board and i put little sayings and stuff on it and this is for public consumption people or is this just for well, you that one's not that oh, one's yeah. that one's my private oh nice yeah it's like almost like a yeah vision board yeah a vision a board. virtual vision board yeah basically yeah nice man you know what i would uh jim is so funny you'll get a kick out of this as well after the holidays especially i go over to this you know this group workout called orange theory so it's like a boot camp and you can burn over a thousand calories if you really crush it in an hour and um the lady last night the teacher she had this mashup station on spotify and i said what is this because it's basically a house beat like the whole time like a martini a high-end sushi restaurant beat right the entire hour and all they do is take verses and choruses from different artists and they mash them up with algorithms and pitch match them so that they all work within the tempo and some of my favorite songs like jeff buckley's hallelujah which will bring you to tears was all quantized cut up and put on the grid and wow. then another one of my favorite songs is which was the pina colada song if you like pina coladas getting caught in the rain from the 70s which i think is like a one-hit wonder you know it sounds like Rusan, the the old uh, remember Rusan's yeah. yeah. It w- this is what I had to work out to yesterday, and I told the instructor, I said, "Not my favorite station. Mm-hmm. You're taking my favorite music from the '70s and '80s and destroying it." <laughs> and she she was looking at me like, "You and your gray hair, old man." <laughs> now the funny thing is, is I burned the most calories out of the entire class, and I was. 15 years older than the oldest person. What, was she wearing Vava Voom pants? She was wearing Vava Voom pants, for sure. Lululemons? Tell you what, I'm a fan. Mm. Uh, Jim, what did you learn, my friend? Uh, you know, I learned... Um, we'll have to put that there for the Vava Voom. <laughs> Vava Voom! Vava Voom! 
Wow. <laughs> My God. <laughs> We're going to get in trouble with I, that. I learned that, you know, <clears throat> so many people we have, <clears throat> excuse me, with storied careers in Nashville still had that terror when it came to at one know, point or another at one point i mean do you still feel that when you go in or is it kind of like yeah no no yeah. i mean not not really it's yeah. over the years and i'm sure that that you've done this i i've tried so many different approaches you know do i listen to this do i listen to that you know a lot of a lot of young drummers like to listen to the bass player i'm like no don't listen to the bass player the bass mm-hmm. player if if you look at any waveforms on Pro Tools, the bass is about three milliseconds behind the kick drum. Mm-hmm. The bass is following you. Right. Don't listen to the bass player. Let the bass player follow you. You know what I listen to in the studio? Tell me. The acoustic guitar and the click and the vocal. If That's the vocal if the vocal is not rushing. If the vocal's rushing <laughs> But I, I never turn the vocal all the way off. I, no. I have a thing where I have to hear the melody. Yeah. If you had to choose only one thing to play to, it yeah. would be the melody. But the acoustic guitar is, is a hi hat that, that plays chords. That's your hi hat. It's yeah. a hi hat that plays. And because he, here's the thing, if if you say you're recording at home and you, you're playing to somebody sends you something that's got acoustic guitar, if the the acoustic guitar accidentally kind of rushes or drags mm. it doesn't make the acoustic guitar sound rushed or dragged it makes the kick drum sound late or mm. it makes the kick drum sound ahead true and and so i that's what i listened to so i tried all these different approaches and i really i i finally kind of came up with a mashup of of several of them that i now know what what to do you mean setting up your cue mix for the great to give yourself the fighting chance of great success exactly yes right. setting up the cue mix because you 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 don't know if you're going to be in the two mix or not you may or may not be in the your steel mix. guitar and the steel guitar and the fiddle are the not the most important things well but and and the funny thing is you'll you'll have some engineers go well i just do a mix in the two but i'll make them make it drum heavy yeah never drum heavy yeah and so a lot of times you've got to figure out ways to overcome not hearing drums in the two mix mm-hmm. do you like ears in the studio or a still headphone guy i i, li- I like the uh ultra phones they're my favorite i like the cans yeah yeah those are really nice and i've been using a lot of the uh, for about a decade the direct sound extreme isolation headphones yep. um you you gave me a pair of at your can yeah so, man yeah. have you ever thought about doing some uh, more clinics I, uh, yes, yes. And I, I'm, I'm working on that as well. Good, so, good, good, yeah. good. So much great stuff, man. Such a, you know what I learned, Jim? I learned that uh, they call Nashville a five-year town, but uh, for Tommy Harden, it was a six-month town. Some, uh, you know? Not bad. You know, honestly, it's, it's you've just, you've got to have a couple big brass ones. It can, it, can, it can happen in the first five minutes of moving here. You can meet someone that can literally change your life with a handshake as you're landing in the Nashville airport or on your fifth year of waiting tables, parking cars, and taking showcases and anything, you can maybe meet that person that'll get you your first job. The main thing is, is you can't quit and you can't be in a rush. My, my first time, you know, I told you about the Gatlin gig and he hands me the, so I learn all these songs. My first time playing with them was Soundcheck opening up for Kenny Rogers in the Minneapolis Ice Hockey Arena. There you go. Hmm. So they had never heard me play before. If I had sucked, they would have been screwed. Yeah. yeah. Bringing your A game every time. Yeah. Every single time. My God. Well, it's so great. Everybody check out the new Lost Hollow record. It's on Spotify, wherever you can find music. It's called Looking for Happy right there. And there, there are some great, serious, oh. if you're into Nashville session players, there's some great, great talent on here. I love that, man. Be a sponge, drummers. Tell you what, check out uh, on Discogs or All Music, check out uh, Tommy Harden's Body of Work. Follow his band Lost Hollow. Jim, as always, I appreciate your time and talent, man. Yes, sir. Thanks. It's so cool uh, to be able to spend all this time together because when I am in town, you and I knock out two, three, four of these things a day. Yeah. And uh, we appreciate all your support, guys. Be sure to subscribe to the show, share it with your friends, give us a rating, give us a five star rating if you love it. Tell everyone about it. Keep showing up for the good stuff. We'll be here. See you next time. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, comment, and follow us at richredman.com forward slash listen.